Our next speaker will be Dr. Pardol. Uh, Dr. Pardol comes to us from Johns Hopkins, where he's the director of the Bloomberg Kimmel Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy, um, Abeloff Professor of Oncology. Okay. Great to be here um, for a number of reasons. Uh, a lot of friends and uh, also, uh, actually, uh, my dad and his family grew up in New Haven, uh, and we used to come up here uh, once a year to visit um, his oldest sister, my favorite aunt, so I have, um, who always had a lot of food available. So I always actually have this great feeling when I come to New Haven. Um, so um, following up on uh, the um, wonderful presentations related to the tumor microenvironment, what's going on in the tumor microenvironment. We've heard um, some very um, different perspectives uh, on how to study and look at the tumor microenvironment, uh, and I'm going to give you a somewhat different um, uh, form of perspective uh, in looking at the tumor microenvironment related to, um, to uh, applying single cell analysis and also taking advantage of uh, a new approach that we've developed to look at um, T cell repertoire and uh, antigen specific T cell responses. Um, so, um, so uh, certainly, and I don't need to tell this audience, um, uh, blockade of the PD-1 pathway has been arguably um, the centerpiece to uh, the revolution in, in cancer uh, immunotherapy. Um, this is uh, a list of, I think it's, um, it gets added to uh, every few months of the cancer types that have been, um, for which uh, one of six anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1 uh, antibodies uh, have uh, been approved. Uh, the ones in um, orange are uh, tumor types that have um, very impressive um, responsiveness, although certainly not 100 percent. The ones in um, yellow uh, the responsiveness, certainly in patients that do respond, uh, the responses tend to be much more durable. Um, but I also um, show that uh, despite um, the FDA approvals, um, there's certainly a long ways to go, and we still have a lot to learn to understand um, T cell responsiveness and immune responsiveness uh, in general. Um, uh, to, to cancers and why uh, cancers respond and why cancers don't respond. Um, it's just an interesting slide I decided to throw in. Um, we've gotten to know some of the folks in Bloomberg Intelligence, um, and uh, so they actually provided me this slide, which is the revenues, they are interested in those things, um, uh, for um, targeted therapy versus immunotherapy. Um, obviously, um, this is predicted, uh, but you can see that immunotherapy is actually catching up. Um, but I, I think this is going to have to end up being revised because more and more there are um, exciting um, results clinically through combinations of immunotherapy and targeted therapy. Um, so I think those distinctions are uh, actually becoming more and more irrelevant as um, this all really um, uh, integrates together. Um, there uh, are actually formally two um, uh, FDA approved um, either uh, companion or complementary um, diagnostics. One is um, PDL1 expression, and, and David um, talked a lot and gave actually a, a wonderful summary of, of where that stands and some of the challenges. Um, the second is um, mismatch. Whoop. I go back. 
um, is mismatch repair deficiency. Um, and certainly people are uh, looking very carefully uh, at mutational burden. Um, has not yet made it to FDA approval. <clears throat> and I think remains to be seen uh, actually where that's going to go, although clearly uh, the mismatch repair deficiency story tells you that if you have extremely high tumor mutational burden, that, that is a predictor for, um, for response. Um, what's interesting is that uh, the simple notion that you have high mutational burden, you have therefore a high immune response, it's going to be more gamma interferon in the tumor microenvironment by adaptive resistance, that's there's therefore going to be higher PDL1 expression. Uh, it's actually quite surprising um, to me uh, how non-concordant these can be. There is clearly some concordance, but there's also a lot of non-concordance, which tells us that there's uh, a lot more um, that we have to understand. And certainly tending to be more B cell focused uh, in our lab, not to imply that they're the most important cells, or it's just the cells that I actually know something about. Um, there are other factors, variables that are very critical, including repertoire, um, functional state of the T cell, as you've been hearing uh, a lot about um, from Greg. Um, and then also myeloid cells, and I haven't even listed uh, fibroblasts in the stroma, um, and that doesn't even talk about um, signaling pathways um, and, and metabolics. Um, so I think certainly if you look uh, at the approved standard of care utilized biomarkers, they really represent a, a tiny percentage uh, of what we need to understand to uh, just looking at the microenvironment itself uh, to really understand how we're going to guide um, future improvements in immunotherapy, which I, I think are, are, I still think we're just scratching the surface. Um, so I'm gonna talk about some of the analyses um, that we've been doing uh, related to uh, an initial um, clinical trial and uh, ongoing work uh, on the application of anti-PD-1 um, in lung cancer uh, as neoadjuvant um, therapy, so giving it before surg surgery in, um, in operable um, patients. Uh, in lung cancer, um, still roughly 60% uh, of operated lung cancer patients relapse, um, and uh, the, the notion that we can do something different um, by giving anti-PD-1 or other immunotherapies up front is being tested now in 12 different cancer types. Um, and uh, I think there's beginning to emerge some early evidence that this may be clinically um, beneficial. What's clear is that because we get the resected tumor after anti-PD-1 uh, is given, it is a gold mine to be able to study um, what is going on in uh, responsive tumors versus non-responsive tumors because you get so much material on therapy, in particular for analyses like um, single cell transcriptomics, et cetera, um, that's particularly useful. Now, when uh, we began these studies, and this was a collaboration between um, the lung cancer team at Johns Hopkins, the lung cancer team uh, at uh, Sloan Kettering, um, supported by CRI and Stand Up to Cancer. Um, the notion, uh, which was somewhat oversimplified, was that you had T cells in the tumor that were tumor specific. Uh, they were being blocked from recognizing uh, the tumor, as you heard from David. Um, uh, that's uh, probably not the, I think it's part of the case, but I, I, I would actually very much agree that that may be very much less than, than half the case. But in any case, you block PD-1 
Um, these cells proliferate, they somehow spill out into the circulation and then um, can leave the circulation, um, traffic through the tissue as activated T cells tend to do, um, looking for their source of antigen in, uh, in the tissue. <clears throat> and in the case of tumor specific T cells, those are distant micrometastases, which are what is responsible for relapse after um, surgery, and, and this would potentially be a way to kill them. Um, we think that that's, that model is wrong <clears throat> through a number uh, of studies, and <clears throat> actually one of the first studies, ironically, was one that um, was actually um, two back-to-back -back papers from uh, our group and Li Ping Chen's group when he was uh, actually at Hopkins, um, looking at um, the ability of um, PD-1 or um, PD-L1 blockade to mitigate tolerance generation uh, among T cells uh, first encountering antigen uh, in, in lymph nodes. So in this particular model, um, and I had to pull this uh, out of an old because I couldn't find uh, the original figures because it was 2007. Um, uh, you give just um, soluble disag disaggregated uh, ovalbumin peptide intravenously. <clears throat> That's a classic um, uh, methodology to induce tolerance. And uh, when you look at uh, what happens when you then try, when you, you look at um, uh, tetramers that pick up uh, the ovalbumin peptide presented by H2KFB, you get a little blip, and this is actually looking in the lymph node, uh, upon the first immunization, and then it goes right down to essentially virtually not detectable. If you try to immunize again, you basically do nothing. So this is the classic uh, um, anergic or exhausted T cell, uh, whatever terminology you want to use. In contrast, if you block either PD-L1 or PD-1, not only do you get uh, a much higher peak um, within the lymph node, um, but you, uh, you normalize out at a, a, a higher level, uh, and also you can re-stimulate. So that shows two things. One is that um, uh, the PD-1 pathway, in addition to being important in the tissue, in the tumor, also is playing a role in early T cell responses to antigen and <clears throat> in particular blocking that pathway can um, at the earliest stages um, partially uh, reverse this energy and I'll say that <clears throat> This, I prefer to use the term energy in a case like this because this is not the classic exhaustion generated from chronic um, uh, uh, presence of, of antigen such as LCMV, um, but this is uh, a case where you're looking at the first exposure to antigen but in the absence of appropriate co-stimulatory signals and a balance shifted to engagement of co-inhibitory signals uh, like PD-1. So you put that together, and actually uh, Max Crummel, uh, Miriam Marat have done some, some very elegant work um, uh, in uh, imaging um, tumor draining lymph nodes and looking at the role of PD-1 pathway blockade there. And so putting that all together, our current vision of how uh, neoadjuvant therapy uh, works um, is uh, through um, potential blockade of the PD-1 pathway um, within the tumor draining lymph node where T cells normally recognizing tumor antigens presented by dendritic cells that picked them up in the tumor went to the draining lymph node uh, is being blocked. That uh, now can um, partially break uh, energy tolerance uh, when the PD-1 pathway is blocked, just as those uh, experiments uh, that we did and, and Li Ping did that I showed you 12 years ago, um, those T cells then leave the draining lymph node 
um, th uh, and, and get into the circulation through the thoracic duct, what we conventionally learned in medical school. Uh, and then from there, they actually circulate back to the tumor and into the tissue. Um, so when we see lymphocytes uh, that expand in number in, uh, after neoadjuvant anti-PD-1, which was, is certainly one of the features, um, this in fact, um, we think now, is really T cells following this pathway and trafficking back um, to the tumor. Um, so in that uh, initial study that we did, um, the results were really quite um, dramatic in that of 20 patients, nine patients or 45% uh, had a pathologic, major pathologic response uh, defined as less than 10% of the viable cells um, in uh, the tumor mass that the surgeon resects are actually viable tumor cells. Um, and Janice Taub has done a lot of work in characterizing that uh, more um, specifically, a lot of characteristic fibrosis, lots of, of lymphocytes, uh, necrotic tumor cells. It really does look different than uh, neoadjuvant um, chemotherapy. But there are also um, uh, certainly lots uh, of patients uh, that with anti-PD-1 alone don't really give you much of a pathologic response at all. So this gives us um, groups of patients uh, that we can call pathologic responders or non-responders. It's not the conventional radiographic response, although I would argue that this is actually a better measure of response because the vast majority of these patients did not have a radiographic response. And so um, uh, until uh, we start uh, employing Anna's uh, imaging technology, uh, when we see, uh, when we're looking at a tumor after therapy, uh, we don't know how much of it uh, really is tumor uh, versus, um, versus lymphocytes infiltrating. In fact, one of these um, pathologic CRs, so this is a patient in which the pathologists see no viable tumor, was actually a patient in which the tumor on radiology slightly grew between initiation of anti-PD-1 therapy and four weeks later, which was the time of surgery. Um, so we're waiting. Um, this was a small group. There are a, a number of larger approval trials um, to, to see uh, how pathologic response correlates with ultimate outcome in terms of relapse-free survival. But just for what it's worth, uh, this cohort of patients uh, has been doing very well. There have been five relapses. Uh, four of the relapses uh, are actually in um, uh, non-responders. Um, and uh, interestingly, uh, and only one of the relapsers uh, was in a responder, uh, in a path responder patient. Um, this is certainly not statistically significant. Um, just throwing it out there. Interestingly, uh, the relapse in the responder was a, a solitary pleural metastasis, um, which was treated about a year and a half ago with uh, RT and chemo and has had no evidence of disease for the last year and a half. But certainly it's the larger studies uh, that are going to tell us more. So, um, so again, the large amount of tumor that we get from surgery uh, gives us a great opportunity um, to do single cell uh, transcriptomics. Uh, and I'm going to also show you data from uh, a platform that we've been using that 10x produces um, that combine single cell transcriptomics and also um, T cell receptor um, sequencing. I should say that I now understand why the company is called 10X, because um, to use their system, which is a great system, it costs 10X what you actually have in your budget. <laughs> um, but um, in any case, so one of the first things to look at, so this is the dimensional reduction uh, of the data. It's obviously a massive amount of data because you're essentially getting uh, a whole genome transcriptomic profile 
from every cell. Uh, originally, people did uh, use Tizni plots. Uh, now, really, UMAP is a, a different dimensional reduction program, which is somewhat better in terms of the distances uh, between two cells uh, in two dimensions being more representative of their overall transcriptional uh, connectivity or disconnectivity. Um, uh, I'm going to show you data from six of the patients were in the process of analyzing uh, about uh, four or five more patients. Uh, this is the merger of the six patients, and these are the individual patients. Uh, these are the non-responders. These are the responders. And this is actually looking at PD-1 expression in red scale. So the darker the red, uh, the more uh, PD-1 is expressed in each of these uh, individual cells. And when you look at the non-responders versus the responders, you can see similarities uh, in the non-responders and in the responders, but they're actually somewhat different, uh, both in their overall um, UMAP um, but also in their PD-1 expression, uh, potentially suggesting that um, PD-1 expression uh, in a responder may mean something different than PD-1 expression in a non-responder. Um, and indeed, um, that's the case. And so one can use an algorithm uh, that looks at um, which genes are most highly associated with PD-1 expression. Uh, and when you do that, you get a very different um, uh, um, set of genes uh, when you compare the responders and the non-responders. So this is a scale from 0 to 1. The more closely uh, allied or corresponding a particular gene is with PD-1, uh, the higher the number. So, um, so PD-1. Uh, always gets a 1 uh, because it's uh, perfectly correlated with itself, obviously. So now if you, that now when you start looking at the most highly PD-1 associated genes in the non-path responders versus the pathologic responders, it's really quite striking. Um, if you look at the top 10 most highly PD-1 associated genes in the non-responder, seven of these um, uh, are, in fact, either uh, classically associated with T-cell exhaustion or uh, have been shown in the literature to um, be, to encode inhibit T-cell um, inhibitory molecules. So you can see number one most um, PD-1 associated gene in the non-responders uh, is, in fact, is, in fact, uh, tox. Uh, second, uh, is actually uh, TIM3. Uh, this is the CD39. If you look at the top 10 in the responders, um, you uh, actually uh, don't see any of these. In fact, on this whole list, uh, the only one that actually uh, comes up is CTLA4. By the way, I forgot to mention, also uh, on this list coming in at number 25 is, uh, is also uh, LAG3. So um, this is a very different picture, and essentially the, only in the non-responders are the PD-1-associated genes um, associated with T-cell inhibition uh, or exhaustion. There are some interesting um, genes here, including um, PGK1, um, so, uh, and actually metabolism uh, does uh, come up when we start looking at these uh, signatures uh, in more detail. Um, there are um, indeed more Tregs, uh, as determined by uh, FOXP3, uh, in the non-responders than in the responders. Um, and uh, in the UMAP, basically the Tregs represent this peninsula coming off the overall CD4 population. So um, basically, the bottom half of the UMAP turns out to be the CD8 cells, and the top half of the UMAP turns out to be CD4 cells, um, and uh, the Treg cells are this peninsula here. But not only do you see about three to four times more Treg cells in the non-responders, 
but there is also uh, this non-responder uh, specific subcluster that you actually don't see in the responders at all. Now, there have been a couple of ways um, that we've analyzed this. Um, uh, Justina Kaushi is the person who's done all the great uh, work on this on the wet bench side, and then Hong Kai Ji uh, and Jia Zha Zhang have uh, been doing um, the bioinformatics. But one of the things that Jia Zha did was um, she went back uh, and pulled out um, about 78 genes that from the literature had been uh, uh, associated with T-Rex. Um, and uh, a lot of these genes, indeed, when you look at the UMAP um, plots of the single cell analysis, are more highly expressed um, in Tregs. But she was specifically looking for genes that were um, expressed at reasonable levels in the non-responders, but were not expressed in the Tregs of the responders. And there were two um, that sort of jumped out. Um, one is actually GARP, uh, and you can see, so these are the non-responders, and these are the responders. Interestingly, this is an amalgamation of single cell analysis from lung cancer resections that didn't receive neoadjuvant therapy. Um, uh, and, and actually, interestingly, um, so these are untreated. Uh, they, uh, in, in many ways, tend to look like the non-responders. Uh, and look different than the responders in the same way that the non-responders. So GARP, you see, sprinkled um, uh, quite um, significantly throughout uh, the Tregs, and it largely is the Treg um, group, whereas there are only about um, three cells among all the Tregs and the responders that are GARP positive. Uh, the other one is EBI3. Uh, and interestingly, Greg, when we looked for P35 or um, uh, P28, we didn't see it in the single cell analysis. Um, single cell analysis doesn't go all that deep. Um, so we're actually, uh, I think this week, uh, Arbor is actually doing QRT-PCR um, to look uh, at, at the sorted um, Tregs. But, these are um, two of the genes that stood out as being um, selective for the, for the non-responders within uh, the Tregs. Um, just to uh, remind people uh, that uh, uh, EBI3 uh, originally identified as one of the two subunits of uh, the IL-12 um, family um, called IL-27, IL uh, but um, Dario's lab, and actually um, Greg was involved in looking at, uh, the, in identifying uh, the receptors for uh, a second uh, EBI3-containing cytokine, which pairs with IL-12's um, uh, P35. Um, GARP is a very interesting um, cell surface receptor. Uh, which is highly expressed on Tregs and, and turns out to actually bind uh, the latent form of uh, or, or um, TGF-beta latency associated protein, which binds um, TGF-beta on the surface of uh, the Treg cell um, uh, in, in an inactive form, and it's only released when, uh, when uh, you have the binding to certain integrins. Um, without GARP, um, basically Treg cells can't release uh, bioactive TGF beta. And actually, a recent paper from Zihai Li's uh, lab with knockouts indeed showed that uh, GARP knockouts um, have uh, higher levels uh, of um, tumor immunity uh, because GARP. Um, sustains the function uh, and accumulation of regulatory T cells. That's probably because TGF beta is not only inhibitory to target cells, but it also feeds back in an autocrine fashion uh, on uh, Treg uh, expansion. Um, another way uh, we can look at 
um, differences in Treg cells between responders and non-responders is to sort of look at the whole populations and particular of interest to compare uh, what are differences in gene expression globally uh, between uh, the Tregs that you see in the responder versus specifically um, this uh, non-responder uh, uh, Treg cluster that you don't see in the responders. Um, and there are many differences, but one of the pretty amazing things that uh, jumped out at us when comparing um, uh, C versus A is this very, very high expression of multiple core stress-induced proteins uh, in the non-responder specific Treg population. And so this raises the question of, is this something that's selective to the Treg cells, or is this a more general phenomenon? And lo and behold, it is indeed uh, more general. So this is looking uh, at uh, HSP A1A, uh, and uh, this is looking at HSP uh, A1B. HSP A1A is actually um, uh, HSP 70. Um, and you can see just by the red color that there are many more cells and much higher level in the non-responders. This is the um, integration of the non-responders. This is the integration of the responders. And basically, I could show you virtually these kinds of plots for virtually all of the core stress-induced proteins, and they would essentially look the same. And this is just breaking it out into the individual non-responders, responders, non-responders, non -responders, responders, to show you that um, this difference is not just driven by one patient, but is really quite um, consistent. So stress uh, comes up, and we're beginning to try to deconvolute what kinds of stress, um, and in fact, uh, hypoxic stress, uh, as well as um, uh, um, uh, reactive oxygen um, stress, oxidative stress uh, seem to certainly be uh, coming up, and I'll harken back um, to Greg's um, presentation uh, on this. Um, and in fact, if you just simply do a correlation coefficient or a correlation plot between percent residual tumor uh, and um, percent of the T cells um, that express uh, HSP A1A above a, a standard threshold. This is the normal associated lung, uh, and there's really not much of a correlation coefficient. But even with this relatively small number of patients, the association with, in the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes uh, gives a correlation coefficient of um, uh, 0.88 with a p-value of um, 0.0037. So this is really, a, a, was a unexpected um, but very striking correlation um, with non-responsiveness. I'll just show you one interesting um, uh, protein downstream of uh, the core stress um, uh, pathway, which is called um, cestrin-1. Uh, which we see much more highly expressed in CD4 cells in the non-responder, uh, very little expression in the CD4 cells in responders. And interestingly, we found a, a paper published in 2017 um, uh, basically showing that it's um, regulation of the ERK junk P38 MAP kinase uh, activation complex, in fact, inhibits immunity uh, in aged um, T cells. So, um, so we think that uh, these stressed T cells um, really are, uh, are not working as well. Pres presumably, that, that may be part of why these patients don't respond, because uh, they're exposed to stress. Um, one can um, do uh, now a clustering uh, within uh, the single cell analysis. I won't go into the methodologies. Um, this, the particular methodologies that our bioinformatics folks like uh, is called phenograph. There are a number of ways to do it. 
um, and these different colors represent the different clusters. This is all of the responders, uh, non-responders, and also untreated together, but one can now look at these different clusters and look at their proportions in responders versus non-responders versus untreated. And um, what you see is that there are some major differences uh, in some of the clusters, and I'll simply point out um, cluster 8 and cluster 17. So cluster 8, the red bars are the responders. So these are much more, these cells are much more highly represented in the responders than in the non-responders, and as I mentioned, the untreateds um, uh, tend to track uh, with the non responder Actually, this is the, the non-responder. In contrast, um, cluster 17 um, is, uh, and these are, again, the CD, uh, within the CD8s, um, is expressed, represents a, a quite a high proportion uh, of T cells in both the non-responders, also in the untreated, and is virtually absent uh, in the responders. Um, so what are driving um, these clusters? Um, so uh, in the responder cluster, cluster 8, um, you see a number of markers of activation, including uh, MHC class 2 expression, but also the most highly uh, uh, upregulated is one of the granzymes, uh, granzyme K. Uh, in the non-responders, um, you see a lot of the stress proteins, uh, other interesting molecules, but this other highly upregulated molecule, um, NR4A1, uh, we wouldn't have known what to make of it until relatively recently when Chen Dong um, published a paper uh, using a genome-wide uh, analysis identifying, uh, identifying NR4A1 as a key mediator of T cell dysfunction. Uh, a couple months after that, Anjana Rao um, similarly identified uh, NRFA1 and TOX uh, as being major mediators of um, T cell uh, dysfunction. So one actually begins to see in looking at sort of real um, tumors post-therapy um, uh, patterns uh, that begin to teach us, at least at the T cell level, um, what are differences associated with response uh, or non-response. Now, one of the um, things that I've always been concerned about with regard to all of these single cell um, papers on tumor infiltrating lymphocytes is that there is a lot to suggest um, that the vast majority of tumor infiltrating uh, lymphocytes are not specific for the tumor. They're just sort of passing through. Um, and I was actually interested to see an amazing tour de force paper um, from uh, the Singapore group that tried to identify with tetramers among TIL um, tumor neoantigen um, specific T cells uh, and in 40 patients, um, they uh, tested uh, 1,100 neoantigen tetramers and were able to actually see a signal with two. I don't want to, th there were a lot of names on that paper, uh, and uh, I would not have been wanted to be one of the postdocs that was working on some of the negative tetramers. Um, but, um, but I think that's really an issue. And so I'm going to present uh, an alternative approach uh, to be, being able to really specifically look at mutation-associated neoantigen-specific T cells. Um, we call them MANA. Um, so just to remind people uh, about um, how diversity is generated in T cell receptors as well uh, as uh, in um, uh, in, in immunoglobulins, really the business end after um, uh, VDJ recombination and uh, N region diversity generation between the V and the D and the D and the J is essentially this region here, which contains all the diversity 
uh, information, uh, and that's the so-called CDR3. Um, and that, at the nucleotide level, um, there are 10 to the eighth different CDR3s uh, that these two mechanisms can generate per chain, which means that if you were to take all of the naive T cells in your body and sequence the alpha and beta chains, uh, you would not ever come up with the same sequence twice. But obviously, you do see lots of sequences repeated, and those, by definition, represent T cells that have seen their antigen and have expanded. Um, that, in fact, expansion of T cells is the single commonality in, in T cells when they recognize antigens. So if a T cell becomes activated to an effector cell, it obviously expands, but there'll be a smaller uh, expansion, but an expansion nonetheless, even if that T cell is on the way to energy or exhaustion. And I'll, I'll liken back to those papers I showed you from 2007, where even in the energic T cells, there was that blip that one can see. So that's essentially what deep sequencing of the CDR3 regions, we call it um, TCR-seq, um, this was pioneered by a company called Adaptive. They're also too expensive, so we now have uh, an in-house um, version. Um, but the beauty of this is not only do you get uh, these pictures of, of clonal size, but um, you also, uh, each CDR3 uh, essentially represents an endogenous barcode uh, for that T cell clone that you can use to follow it in various tissues, time points in the blood, et cetera, et cetera. So um, taking advantage of this, uh, Kelly Smith and Franck Rousseau came up with a nifty assay called MANIFEST, which stands, stands for Mutation Associated Neoantigen Functional Expansion of Specific T Cells. Needless to say, we came up with it because it's got a catchy acronym. Um, it's actually relatively straightforward. It's much more sensitive and specific than an LE spot. Um, fairly simple steps. You, you whole exome sequence. Uh, you put your mutations through a conventional um, uh, uh, MHC binding algorithm. We use uh, a variant of uh, NetMHC PAN4. Um, you then take your top predicted peptides, and anybody who's done that realizes that this is highly imperfect, but it gives you um, sort of the top possibilities. Um, you then just synthesize those peptides. You do a one-step simulation, but instead of uh, analyzing uh, cytokine production as you would with an LE spot, uh, you analyze using TCR-seq uh, clonal expansion. Uh, and the beauty of this in terms of specificity is that if you're testing 50 peptides and you see a given clone expanding uh, to peptide 7, then for that clone, peptide 1 through 6 and peptide 8 through 50 are your negative controls. So we see a lot of nonspecific expansion of various clones, and you see these in multiple wells, but only when you see it in one well. Um, and we have a, a statistical um, algorithm uh, that we use to determine uh, the specificity, but only then do we call it um, specific. Um, so with this, and again, a lot more sensitive, we've been picking up more and more T cell responses against oncogenic mutations. Um, if you go to the literature, um, you read um, papers from folks like Steve Rosenberg, from Tan Schumacher. Um, Rosenberg have, has one or two cases where he's found it, but you would think that these were actually very, very rare responses against the oncogenic mutations. It turns out they're actually much more frequent than had been previously appreciated when you use a more sensitive assay. So this is an example in one of the lung cancer patients, very interestingly, where we picked up a positive. These are three different T cell clones. These are two different T cell clones above the background. 
um, against uh, a um, 10 mer and a 9 mer, both incorporating this particular patient's oncogenic BRAF mutation, uh, N581I, um, which uh, in lung cancer it turns out that only half of the BRAF mutations are V600E, so this was one of the others that it clusters. Um, Roy will be proud of the fact that I'm becoming more and more of a lung cancer doctor. I almost sound like I know what I'm talking about. Um, but don't ask me too many detailed questions because then I'll refer you to uh, Julie or Patrick. But in any case, we are, we're seeing this more and more. Um, uh, and I think that's very interesting in terms of the thinking about the ability to generate T cell receptors that you can use for adoptive transfer that are specific for common um, uh, oncogenic mutations. Um, so what one can do with uh, this assay then um, is um, actually very cool given this single cell platform that allows you to simultaneously for every cell not only do the transcriptome but also um, uh, look at the CDR3s for both the alpha and the beta chain of that T cell. So what you can do is you can take your manifest validated um, T cell clones, and again using this barcode, and look at the subset of TIL that you know are specific for neoantigens in the tumor, and sort of pull those out from the sea of other T cells. Um, and uh, this is useful, uh, as I mentioned, for potentially uh, finding um, uh, and cloning out T cell receptors for specific oncogenic drivers, but also discovering genes uh, associated with dysfunction versus reactivation, i.e. in the responders, uh, after um, checkpoint blockade. So this is an example of a complete responder patient uh, from the, um, actually from uh, the New England Journal study um, that was published last year. This is an example of uh, three clones. It actually turns out that these two uh, in-frame TCR betas uh, are from the same T cell clone. We found out that actually happens in about 1% of T cells, that you actually have two in-frame betas. And you, even more frequently, you, you can actually find two in-frame alphas. Um, but so this is really two T cell clones uh, present in quite high frequency pre-anti-PD-1 um, uh, treatment uh, in this neoadjuvant patient. Interestingly, uh, went down uh, in the tumor upon resection. This. Um, uh, there's a recent paper talking about clonal replacement. Uh, I'm not so sure it's not just clonal dilution. Um, but interestingly, in the tumor draining lymph node, uh, these clones are present at quite high levels, and that's at least concordant with the notion that there is stimulation of tumor neoantigen specific clones that's going on not in the tumor, but in fact in the tumor um, draining lymph node. And if you look in the peripheral blood, um, and we see this commonly, um, between two and four weeks after treatment, this is actually days relative to surgery, uh, the treatment starts four weeks before surgery in this trial. So this is pre-treatment, um, this is two weeks after initiation of treatment, and this is uh, right before, this is uh, uh, day of surgery, and then they come down, and we can postulate potentially that what's happening here is that cells are now uh, beginning to exit the peripheral blood and circulate through the tissues, and um, and hopefully uh, finding micrometastases. So, um, uh, Justina um, Kashi, with uh, help. Um, from uh, Emily Zhao in, in uh, Bert Vogelstein's group. We're actually turning Bert into a cancer immunologist. Um, uh, and so my vision of world domination of cancer immunotherapy is in fact um, coming true. Um, so uh, what 
um, she did was to take a jerk hat as a reporter line, um, crisper out the endogenous alpha and beta genes, jerk hat still expresses the CD3s, put in CD8, because this is all um, looking at MHC class one restricted responses, and a uh, NFAT driven uh, luciferase um, to make it uh, an easy um, readout. In the old days, we used to look at IL-2 production by JERCAT as a measure of TCR. So this is essentially just a readout for um, recognition of the peptide. And um, this is just a, a test run with a pair of T-cell receptors uh, from an EBNA4 uh, NP-specific T-cell clone. Um, and you can see when you use uh, EBNA4 NP peptide, you see a nice dose response curve when you look at luciferase expression. Um, and then this is uh, EBNA2 as, as a negative control. So this is a very easy, very clean assay. And actually, after taking all the trouble to make uh, these lines and everything, this actually can be done in very high throughput, um, actually with electroporation. Um, uh, she can basically query 96 um, uh, uh, TCR pairs at a time. So, so this is really getting to be a, a reasonably high throughput uh, approach. Um, so for uh, this particular clone, uh, this is the dose response curve. So this is the final formal 100% proof um, that this clone really is specific for this neoantigenic peptide because this is taking the alpha and betas out and reconstituting the JERCAT. One interesting question is what is the functional avidity, which is not the best term in the world, but it's essentially the, the dose response curve against the neoantigen versus sort of the ultimate um, uh, memory um, effector response, which would be to a viral antigen such as EBV. And interestingly, the functional avidity, again, measured by the dose response, is almost uh, identical, um, which is um, really not what, have I, what I would have predicted. Um, but what it says is that um, there are the, these tumor specific T cells have pretty reasonable um, uh, T cell receptors. It's not like these really um, wimpy, uh, low affinity T cell receptors that you can often see against um, autoantigens. Um, so um, what happens now when you overlay these clones on the UMAP plot for um, this particular responder patient? And what you see, and so the red triangles uh, are one of the clones, and the blues, there were fewer of these. I can tell you to see these clones um, took 80,000 cells on a single cell, and if anybody here uses 10X, you're probably gasping. I gasped when I saw the, um, uh, the bill. But in any case, about 50% of these clones you can see are clustering uh, in this one cluster in this patient, um, cluster 16 in the clustering map. Um, and it so what is this cluster? What are these clones? And these turn out to be, this cluster is the tissue resident memory T cell cluster. So about half of uh, these clones are classic TRMs, CD103, CD69, CXCR6. They express Hobbit, which is the transcription factor that maintains um, TRMs in their sort of poised um, state. This got me very excited because I'm a Tolkien fan and I always wanted to work on Hobbit. So um, particularly exciting for me. Uh, but, it's also, but the question is, what about um, these other clones in different places? Um, and actually, um, these have signatures of acutely activated T cells. Um, and when you actually use these programs like FATEMAP, which is uh, a version um, of um, so-called pseudotime, which gives you connectivities, you can actually see connections that go from this um, sort of, call it a resting TRM cluster, to uh, 
uh, into activated um, cells uh, as a continuum. So what about clones and non-responders? So I'll show you one example of that. What I can tell you is that um, when we do the manifest analysis, we see as many, uh, or and look uh, in, in the um, till, we see as many neoantigen-specific cells in the non-responders as in the responders, um, which to me is actually very exciting because it says that in non-responding patients, it's not like they don't have T cells. So we can figure out what's really going on in the non-responders the substrate of tumor reactive T cells is in those patients. So to me, again, that's, that's actually very uh, exciting, at least in lung cancer, and, but I think you know, we're gonna be able to obviously query a lot of cancers. Um, so this was uh, a non-responder. Interestingly, this particular T cell clone, which again, you can see um, clustering here. In fact, uh, this particular cluster you see here and sort of winds up here. This is this orange cluster here, which um, uh, was called just cluster zero. Um, this particular clone also validated through the jerkit transfer uh, actually sees a hotspot P53 mutation. Um, and again, this is a non-responder. So just because the T cell clone is there doesn't mean the patient is gonna have a response. So the question is, what is the transcriptomic profile of this patient? And these are some of the, the top genes here. And what's interesting is that it's, it doesn't parse out into a simple um, definition as per the literature. It's somewhat of a combination uh, or a mix of tissue resident memory. Uh, it does have Hobbit. It does have CD103. Um, together with you know, activation ready or activated, you see the granzymes that are up. And this is relative to all CD8 cells. Um, you see that HLA class 2 is up, perforin is up. But you also see something that you didn't see at all in the manispecific T cell clones that I showed you from the responder patient, which is now a number in red shown here of exhaustion molecules, including LAG3, um, CD39, and also, um, it's interestingly, because PD-1 comes up on this, which says that the levels, uh, it's not, these aren't the only cells that are PD-1 positive, but it says that the levels of PD-1 on, uh, on these cells are higher than when you take the sum total comparator of all CD8 cells, which again fits with the notion that exhausted cells sort of lock on very high levels of PD-1. And you also um, see um, uh, a, uh, one of the heat shock proteins coming out, uh, HSP uh, A1B. So, um, so I think what the picture that's emerging here is that, uh, and again, this is just looking at the T cells, so one could argue it's like, you know, trying to look at the elephant and we're focusing just on the trunk or just on the left ear, but it's certainly uh, an important piece of the anti-tumor immune response. What we're seeing uh, are some patterns that at least uh, give us a potential working model um, for differences um, going on in T cell transcriptional programs um, for responders versus non-responders. And I'm gonna propose that uh, a lot of this has to do with um, whether or as how, mu of how much stress exists in the tumor microenvironment. Again, uh, there's hypoxic stress, um, uh, oxidative stress, ER stress, metabolic stress, this is something we're just beginning to parse out. Um, but certainly, we see this as a very strong signature selectively in non-responders, and I showed you some examples. 
That leads to energic or exhausted or dysfunctional T cells. Um, there are some hints that glycolysis is, uh, is lower, just looking at, at some of the levels of genes associated that encode uh, enzymes uh, linked to glycolysis. Checkpoints are up. Exhaustion transcription factors like tox uh, are um, also up. Um, you also saw NAB1, which um, um, uh, Craig will, uh, will uh, remember from uh, his uh, PhD thesis. Um, and you see um, an increase in Treg number uh, as well as genes encoding suppressive um, uh, factors uh, that allow Treg cells to suppress uh, efficiently. Um, we're obviously going to have to go back. In fact, um, where is he? During your talk, I actually texted Zsa, Zsa to look at the, the um, lactate transporters. Um, that's the great thing about having these great bioinformatics colleagues is you can text them and usually within two hours you get an answer back and you've got a new discovery. Um, in contrast, if you have a low stress environment when you block PD-1, if you have enough T cells, um, you get productively activated T cells. Again, we think they start uh, in the lymph node and then ultimately make their way back um, to the tumor, um, and they traffic to the tumor where a lot of them take up a tissue uh, resident memory um, transcriptional program, but then can also, uh, with increased activation, glycolysis, um, and cytotoxic machinery, um, can uh, uh, turn into an active killer cell uh, and ultimately uh, kill the tumor. Um, obviously, much more to be done, but um, a working model um, that, uh, that some of uh, this profiling uh, is allowing us to do. So I um, uh, want to thank um, certainly the patients uh, who have been great, um, our collaborating clinical trial centers, in particular um, Sloan Kettering for the trial, behind the data that uh, I showed you, um, and support from a number of groups. Um, certainly, uh, tremendous thanks to Sidney Kimmel uh, and the Bloomberg uh, Foundation. Um, actually, this was taken a few years ago. Uh, we need a, a wide-angle lens. Um, now, because uh, everybody in the Kimmel Cancer Center at Hopkins is an immunotherapist. Thank you. about the oncogenic components. Um, mm -hmm. And I was wondering whether you saw specific patterns in the types of oncogenic mutations um, that you were detecting, for which you were detecting responses in your study. Um, so we don't yet see an obvious pattern, other than the fact that we can find T cells um, more frequently uh, than, than we had expected. Now again, in some cases they're relatively infrequent and it's just because we have uh, a very sensitive assay to pick them up. Um, but as of now, and again this may just be numbers, uh, we, there's no obvious pattern that jumped out. Hi, that was a beautiful talk. Um, I wanted to ask you how much of the nice gene signatures that you see in responder versus non-responders within the tumor environment, can you re detect in the peripheral blood of these patients? Yeah, so um, the problem with peripheral blood, and you actually see this when you follow the frequencies of MANA-specific T cells, is that they are extremely diluted. Um, and so I have to say we haven't looked with single cell analysis because the frequency, you can find these, um, as you saw, you can find these um, manis specific T cells by the barcoding, but I don't know if you noticed 
um, the y-axis for frequency among the till versus the PBL, but they're, you know, a hundred to a thousand fold lower. Um, that said, um, my neighbor Jonathan Powell is working on what uh, looks like it could be a more of a global um, metabolic signature. Um, so I'd say we haven't looked, but my prediction is that it's, you know, these are so environment specific um, that I don't know that we would, we, we would necessarily see them. And again, I, you know, I, th I just think the peripheral blood is, the, the relevant T cells are just so diluted out. So great stuff, Drew. Uh, in the one of the strongest correlates with PD one in the responders was RBP J kappa. So what's going on with Notch in the responders? Yeah, um, I don't know, but anybody who has some good ideas for us to follow up, um, we certainly need to obviously look at downstream um, Notch. Um, regulated genes and and that particular one I, I think is it's just it's a subset it's not all of the notch related it's sort of an offshoot it's something that I have to read more about um, but if you have any interesting ideas we're really I, needless to say notch is not uninteresting uh, and this this also actually um, came up in the PP in the in the responder when you actually looked at the mana um, specific cells. I, I don't know if, if I had it on the list there, but it's, it, it's on sort of the list of the, the top 30 or, or 35 genes there. So it's not just globally, but actually when you look at the MANA specific clone within the tilt in the responder. So please, any, any interesting thoughts in terms of following that up? In your model, you, you very nicely showed um, the um movement to the lymph node. And I wondered whether you were also thinking about the possibility of tertiary lymphoid tissues in the tumor themselves, which in some cases have uh, predicted better outcomes, better prognosis. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, you do get, you do see tertiary lymphoid structures um, in, in lung cancer. Um, we are actually working with ACD, and actually there was one recent paper that can actually um, do RNA scope specific for the CDR3s. And when you actually combine it, the alpha CDR3 and the beta CDR3, um, you can actually get some, some, some real specificity. Um, we've actually piloted it with them. It actually works. Um, impressively well. Sometimes it takes some tweaking. Um, so that's, so I'm hoping to actually have that answer uh, for you soon. It's, it's actually, it's at the top of our list of, of interest in terms of where we're interested to look to be, able, to be able to find these clones in sections. Thank you. Really nice uh, talk, Drew. The, um, you talked about clonotype frequency, and it looked like you had paired pre-therapy and at four-week time point um, samples that you did single-cell RNA-seq with TCR evaluation. Is that right? No. Oh. So the, the untreateds are, are a separate group. Okay. Now, we have gotten better at actually doing single-cell uh, on um, pre-treatment bronchoscopic biopsies. So we have about three cases now in the expansion. So we, we will be able to have pre and post, but those are just lung cancer resections uh, from patients that didn't get any neoadjuvant treatment. Well, I guess related to that, what I was wondering was, if you look at the clonotypes that are expanded at the four-week time point, if you have any of those relative to the pre-therapy, do they have a higher frequency of tumor reactivity or anything like that? I mean, so with the therapy, do you actually enrich for a tumor reactive T cells? Yeah, um, so very good question. Um, and there are some interesting patterns that we see when we take sort of the most highly represented clones, one of which is that the expansion 
of those clones that we find in the periphery between week two and week four is actually very highly correlated with response. When we've actually looked with the manifest validated clones um, in the assay, we don't see them in those, those very common clones. We do see some clones because we always do an EBV CMV flu positive control in the manifest assay. We do see some of those. Now that doesn't mean that the manifest specific cells aren't in there because we, the statistics that we do for the assay is set up to have as low as possible um, a false positive rate, but I'm sure we have a lot of false negative rates. With this jerkit transfer, actually, what we are um, going to do is simply take you know the top clones and just do the transfer and then just test the peptides. That might actually turn out to be easier to see. But right now, we haven't seen overlap. One of the therapeutic modalities that has worked in cancer is to amplify the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes from the tumor. And in your data, it looked like there were just as many tumor reactive T cells in the adjacent normal lung than in the tumor itself. And I'm wondering if that's the case. And you also talked about that they might be in the adjacent lymph node and then home to the tumor when they're activated in the checkpoint blockade situation. So should we be getting draining lymph nodes instead of tumor when we're isolating tumor reactive T cells? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And um, you do indeed find, um, so the example I showed you of the responder, I didn't talk about it, but if you notice that um, you could find those clones in the normal lung, just as you said, sharp eyes, um, and they also clustered, you know, the majority of them similarly clustered uh, in that TRM um, cluster. Uh, and one of the things that's come up, and uh, actually um, we're going to ask the patient for a skin biopsy, because one question is, is some of this somewhat tissue specific? Um, there are now, there, there is data in experimental models that um, there are tissue specific components of the TRM program. So that's something we're actually uh, very interested in, um, in in looking at that question. Thank you. Well, let's thank uh, Dr. Pardall for a really great talk.